You're um, fine. Yeah, I'm having internet issues, but I can still work with it. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, for this presentation, we ask that you leave the questions towards the end, or if you prefer, you can write them in the chat box, um, and we will read them and address them at the end. So um, Ryan and I will give you a quick review of how we got here and decisions that have already been made and adopted. So we started the 2045 long range transportation planning process in the fall of 2018. Um, since then we have developed goals and objectives that align with the national goals and planning factors, Florida statute and emphasis areas, and the MPO's existing project prioritization scoring system. So these goals, objectives, and scoring criteria were adopted in September 2019. The previous long range transportation plan and scoring system had six goals, and now we have eight goals. Previously, equity and livability were a subset of environment conservation, which was previously environmental justice. And because technology and autonomy are a way to address congestion, they were a subset of mobility reliability but are now a separate category. Um, in October, the MPO board committee members and the public provided input on three different themes that came out of the workshops and surveys done in the first half of the year. So these are to preserve what is important, provide choices and promote opportunities. The vision for the 2045 LRTP is to create a transportation system that promotes economic diversity, preserves environmental health, and create vibrant places. And the vision and guiding principles were presented at our February 2020 workshop, and the board unanimously approved them at their meeting in April. So Ryan, if you can please continue. the 2035 long range transportation plan and continued in the 2040 plan to revitalize the corridor. Last year, the MPO completed an evaluation of the MMEC program, which is available on the MPO website. It included a review of the completed and funded projects, an analysis of future plan and requested funds, as well as the safety assessments at the high crash locations. Uh, the study concluded that while significant progress has been made, there are still more opportunities for safety and redevelopment improvements on US 41. It's also important to note that while the investment of the MPO's uh, funds is capped at $3 million per project, the total investment in the 20 completed and funded project exceeds $200 million, meaning significant state and federal funds have been added to support the MPO's priorities. At their 2020 meeting, the MPO board voted to continue the MMEC program in the 2045 LRTP. The MPO receives approximately $10 million each year for motorized projects, which could include transit, as well as $600,000 annually for non-motorized projects. In addition to the MMEC, uh, I've listed uh, some funding categories that were included in the 2040 LRTP. So as we know, going backwards, um, in 2040, US ME, the US 41 MMEC corridor uh, allowed a maximum of $3 million per project. Uh, congestion management, you know, those quick fix, turn lane type projects that help address congestion issues. We were allowing $1 million per project. Uh, the advanced traffic management system or technology type investments allowed a maximum of $2 million per county annually. Uh, those are the non-motorized projects as transportation alternatives. That was a maximum of $600,000 per project, but also required a match. And then the regional roadway network, which is those large scale local road projects that were named in the cost feasible of the LRTP, uh, such as Venice Bypass US 41, as well as 15th Street East, these types of projects, which uh, received the majority of the MPO SU funding over the last 10 years. Uh, next slide, Jennifer. Um, so now the real challenge is determining how we invest these funds to meet the adopting goals and objectives that Alvi's covered and to help transform our transportation, transportation system from where we are today towards the vision the community has defined over the past year. Um, do we keep the existing funding categories? Do we change the funding limits? Do we create new categories to address things like safety and resiliency, technology, other things that um, that we want to invest in? Do we revise the funding, for, uh, the funding formulas? Uh, do we change the amount of money? 
uh, that we that we apply to each category. Do we include transit, bike ped, complete streets? Of course, we've always had more ideas than we've had dollars to actually apply to projects. Um, and that's why we'll present, um, and Franco will help present the revenue forecast uh, prior to this discussion. Uh, so with that, um, Franco Saracino from Kittleson Associates will cover um, kind of the revenue forecasts that we can expect over the next 25 year time horizon. Thanks. Again, Ryan, this is Jennifer Musselman. I'll actually jump in first. Okay, thank you. And yeah, thanks, Ryan. Cover some of the elements that are informing the creation of the needs plan before Franco jumps into the revenue forecasts. So the first big piece of the needs plan development is, of course, the local priority. So when the MPO put out their call for projects, they received 88 applications from local governments. And then there are 52 projects that are currently prioritized. And some of those projects may have partial funding, but are still awaiting funding for future phases. We're also taking a look at the plans that the MPO has put together over the past several years. So one of those is the safety plan that identified 10 priority corridors for motorized crashes and for non-motorized crashes. This year, the MPO did a bit of a reevaluation looking at high crash intersections. And so there was 20 locations that came out of that assessment. Moving on to mobility, the MPO recently completed the congestion management plan, and this identified 35 projects, and these were identified through a variety of performance measures, including safety, delay, travel time reliability, truck travel time reliability, and the presence of existing ITS infrastructure. And it, the plan also identified some potential solutions to these challenges, including advanced traffic management systems, ramp metering, um, variable speed limits, a variety of techniques. Last year, the MPO also completed the active transportation plan. And this plan included almost 80 projects to fill gaps in the regional bicycle and pedestrian network. So this may include um, locations where there are currently no bicycle facility or locations where there may be a high-speed bike lane an, an on-street bike lane on a high-speed facility that maybe we should take a look at putting a separated facility in. So there's a variety of projects included in this plan as well. Uh, moving on to economy, the MPO has their key freight corridors and the key freight bridges um, that we can tap into for the needs plan. And um, similarly with the infrastructure condition, we have the upcoming resurfacing schedule and also the list of bridge conditions that we can take a look at. And the MPO has also undertaken some larger studies that were intended to identify some short-term solutions and some longer-term capital projects that could become part of the long-range plan. So this includes the Barrier Islands Traffic Study and the Central Manatee Network Alternatives Analysis that both have a list of projects within them. And so with all of these plans and local priorities, we think we have most things covered, but we did one final look to see if there was any needs that were still missing. So what we did was we scored every roadway segment within the MPO network based on the MPO's prioritization criteria. Um, and then you can see on this map, just an example from Bradenton. So you can see the orange and red segments are those higher scoring segments. So in theory, if these um, roadways had projects on them, they would score high within the MPO's prioritization process. Um, we did overlay with the projects that were submitted, and there is really good overlap, um, but where place it, places where there may not be a project may be an opportunity for further study. For each of the municipalities, we'll be compiling all these plans and putting together the full list of project opportunities. Um, I think the NMPO staff can correct me if I'm wrong. Throughout all of these efforts, there's over 400 unique projects. 
Um, so municipalities have a lot of different options and a lot of different potential funding sources, which um, Franco will talk more about in a bit. Um, and at the end, we'll share some dates, but we'd like to meet with each jurisdiction to go through this list of projects, see if there's anything missing before we finalize the needs plan and ultimately move into the cost feasible plan. So with that, I will hand it over to Franco to talk more about the financial projections. Kyle, can you hear me? Okay. Um, right, so uh, next slide, Jen. So uh, revenue forecasting um, is a federal requirement um, in the update of an LRTP because, of course, the culmination of this whole planning effort is a federally required cost feasible or cost affordable plan. Um, so what that means um, in, in a very, in a sort of accounting sense is that we need to stack up our prioritized improvements um, and balance them against uh, financial resource forecasts. So the money that we expect to be available to pay for transportation improvements uh, and O&M uh, over the plan period uh, from now to 2045. So there's two sort of broad categories of funding. Uh, that, that I'll present. The first is state and federal, uh, and the revenue projections from state and federal sources uh, were provided by uh, the Florida Department of Transportation, as is customary in LRTP. Uh, but then there's also local revenues uh, that are used for transportation improvements, uh, and our study team uh, was responsible for forecasting, forecasting those revenues. Um, in addition to presenting uh, revenue forecasts that are, that are consistent with current fiscal policy, in other words, uh, sources, taxing sources, and revenue sources that are currently in place in policy. Uh, we also took a look at sales surtax revenue post sunset uh, in the two counties. In Manatee, the, or I'm sorry, in Sarasota County, the, the current sales surtax sunsets in 2025, and in Manatee in 2032. So we took a look at the additional revenue that could be in place beyond those two sunset years uh, for the plan period. Next slide. All right, so starting with the state and federal revenue programs, I want to stress these are not revenue sources, they're programs. Uh, these are sort of the, the categories provided to MPOs by FDOT. Um, and the, the graphic at the bottom of the slide is organized as, a, as sort of a flexibility continuum. Uh, where on the left side, these are the funds that are not flexible. We don't have a lot of, of wiggle room to, to allocate those funds versus on the right side of the graphic, the ones we, we do have the flexibility. So starting with SIS, uh, the Strategic Intermodal System, this represents more than half of all state and federal funds that are available for transportation. Um, and actually, the revenue forecasts were not provided to us by FDOT. What we did is we... Um, compiled the project costs from SIS improvements in the cost feasible plan that are in Sarasota and Manatee counties um, and used that as a revenue source. So the, the SIS cost feasible plan is done in Tallahassee by FDOT in coordination with the, their districts and, and also the locals, uh, but we don't have any leeway to, to allocate those funds. The next program is other roadways, uh, other, of course, referring to other than SIS. Uh, so state roadways that are not on the strategic intermodal system. Uh, and these are a little bit more flexible uh, in that we allocate those to primarily state roadway improvements uh, in the plan, but up to 10% of those revenues can also be used for uh, what FDOT calls off-system roadways or non-state non roadways, so a little bit more flexible. Then we have the transportation alternatives and transit programs which are significantly more flexible, although uh, typically the transit funds are, 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 are accounted for in uh, our transit agency TDPs, and, and we don't have a lot of those funds to work with. Uh, transportation alternatives, of course, is a very small pot of funding that is dedicated to um, uh, non-roadway multimodal improvements. And finally, we have the TMA, or Transportation Management Area, also known as SU funds. And these are the most flexible. These are the funds that are 
that are allocated directly to the MPO through FDOT and can be used on any sort of capacity improvements, whether it's sidewalks or transit capital costs or roadways, whether they're state roadways or off system. Next slide. Uh, then we have the local revenue programs, which consist uh, primarily of fuel taxes. We have state distributed fuel taxes, um, including the county gas tax and the constitutional gas tax, uh, both of which are, are distributed to all counties in the state, regardless of, of local policy. Uh, and those, those funds are distributed based on uh, historical receipts, um, geographical and population size of respective counties. We also have local option fuel taxes. Up to 12 cents can be levied uh, locally, including in three, three separate programs, the one to five cent, one to six cent, and the ninth cent fuel tax. So all 12 cents in Sarasota and Manatee counties are currently levied. Um, the fuel taxes I've, I've sort of put on the left side of the continuum here because um, while they are flexible, um, all of the fuel taxes in, in, in terms of current budgetary policy in both counties are dedicated to, um, uh, to debt service on existing bonds and the rest to uh, existing O&M uh, uh, costs of the existing system. So in terms of current budgetary policy, those monies are not available for capacity improvements. Um, and then we have the transportation impact fee program um, which is flexible in that, it, it, in fact, it must be used for capacity improvements to address uh, growth uh, on which the, the, the fees are collected. Next slide. So uh, in terms of the state and federal uh, forecasts, uh, as I mentioned, uh, more than half, uh, about 60%, in fact, are CIS, uh, and it's, that's about $2.9 billion of the total $4.9 billion. Uh, and state and federal re uh, revenues. Uh, the next largest program is the Other Roadways Program, which is about 1.1 billion, um, or about 24% of state and federal revenues, uh, followed by the Transit Program at 500 million, which is about 11%. Um, and then the last, the last bits of state and federal revenues are the TMA and TA programs, which is about 6%. And I want to, I want to state again that. That last, those last two categories, TMA and TA, are the only really two programs that we have a, uh, any degree of flexibility in terms of addressing local needs on off-system roadways. Um, so it's really critical for local matches uh, to, be, to be put into play in order to leverage these funds and really make them go, um, go further. Um, as Ryan mentioned, you know, US 41 MMEC um, you're looking at, at 200 million of needs just on that corridor alone. So um, really leveraging with local funds, whether it's gas tax revenues or general fund revenues, uh, property taxes and so forth, that while may not be currently, <clears throat> excuse me, allocated to transportation improvements, uh, really are going to be critical to, to accomplishing uh, some of those local, uh, local priorities. Uh, next slide. Um, so, uh, in terms of the local revenues, I've broken it out by county. In Sarasota County, uh, we've got about half uh, of the revenues are gas tax related. Uh, so, uh, 440 from the local option fuel taxes, uh, the rest from, from, from state fuel taxes and ninth cent. So, again, half of those funds are currently um, committed to debt and O&M uh, costs. Um, then we've got the impact fee program at 559 million, which is about 38% of total local revenues in Sarasota County, uh, and the sales surtax, which is is about 15%. Now again, this only that sales surtax forecast only goes out the first five years, uh, because we're 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 assuming that 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 source that that revenue source sunsets and does not renew. Uh, next slide. Uh, so for Manatee County, similar situation, a little less uh, uh, represented by fuel taxes, primarily because the sales surtax goes a little further out, uh, but about 41% of all the local revenues represented here are fuel taxes, and so again, off the table in terms of, of capacity improvements. Uh, about 27% 
uh, from impact fees and 19% and uh, from the sales surtax for a total of 1.9 billion. Next slide. So this slide gives you kind of a side-by-side a, a -side snapshot of the state and federal uh, Sarasota County and Manatee County revenues. And what I've done is cross-hatch the, the, the portion of those revenues that really uh, we don't have uh, flexibility to work with, uh, including, again, 60% of SIS um, and about half of all local revenues. Um, I want to also I want to stress again that what is represented here is revenues that are currently used at the county, state, and federal level um, for transportation improvements. Uh, so it doesn't include property taxes. It doesn't include um, any general fund revenue that's currently not allocated uh, to transportation. And I think it's important to note because in terms of putting together the LRTP, we have to do it based on on current policy, um, but that does not prevent local governments from putting other revenues up uh, to, to, um, to sort of sweeten the deal, if you will, and, and make that pot of money a little bigger. Uh, next slide. So finally, um, in terms of those sales surtaxes, the money that is not being accounted for because of the sunsetting dates of those two, uh, for the two counties is about 1.3 billion for Sarasota County and 700 million for Manatee County. So a total of about 2 billion. Um, and I wanted to kind of include this to, just to kind of give some perspective of what happens if those, those surtaxes are renewed. Again, um, by federal policy or guidelines, we can't, um, uh, we can't include those as part of our cost feasible plan, but we can think about those monies as potential uh, for some kind of scenario or gaming in terms of the additional improvements that could be accomplished um, if these two revenue sources were to be extended uh, for the life of the plan. Uh, so that's it um, for, uh, for the revenue forecasts. Um, there will be a report that kind of gives you all the nitty gritty details. Didn't want to put anybody to sleep today on this, on this call, so I didn't include any of that. Um, so I think now we're going to switch. I'm going to hand it back off to Ryan and we're going to kind of open it up for discussion about investment priorities in terms of programs, in terms of how we use these funds uh, to start to craft a cost feasible plan. Yeah, great, thank you, Franco. Great. Thank you, uh, okay. we, we We do wanna take a look at, at the revenue that we do have available, uh, as, as Franco just pointed out. And like I mentioned earlier, looking at our, our current funding mechanisms for certain project types, um, whether it's MMEC or CMS, or any or TA, any of those types of projects, and you know, look at how if we do we want to expand those? Do we want to change how much we're actually committing to those? Do we want to add new project types? Those are all kinds of things that are up for discussion. And at this point, uh, we just want to hear your recommendations prior to, uh, as we previously mentioned, we'll be setting up staff meetings as well, staff meetings as well as following up with, with community town tour meetings to go over these project lists as well as any of your funding considerations and concerns going forward. So with that said, I'll um, move to the next slide and take a look uh, and we'll go through the roll call once again and, and you can provide any, any immediate reaction or comment. Um, and this will be recorded, so we'll have all this um, on record as well. And um, we, well, we, we can obviously discuss these going forward in our, in our other private staff meetings as well. Um, so with that said, I'll start at the top again. Mike Arnold. Yes. Want to provide any give any immediate comment or feedback? No, uh, not right now. No, it looks good. Good work. Okay. Well, we'll 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 set up and we'll set up our, our our staff meeting and give you some time to look at this. And like Franco said, we'll we'll provide a, the full report. Um, okay. Thank with you. All the, with all the details, so you can have a, a, a more of a chance to look through all of that. Okay. Uh, Sarah Blanchard. Yes. Just uh, we mentioned about the additional meetings that will be set up. Will there be a meeting with transit staff specifically, or are we going to be meeting with Sarasota County and the MPO? Um, yes, how, I, how I, 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 I can't. Answer, I, I don't know exactly for sure, but I, to me, I would. I haven't even really fully discussed it, but I would assume yes. The the, the the transit agencies would have would have their own private meeting for those as well. So we could we could work through any of your questions or concerns too. 
I'll, I'll, thank you. Yeah, all right. Yeah, we'll we'll plan on doing that. Great. Uh, Ken Bontrager. Isaac Brownman. So um, I would just say that the, the town's priorities obviously continue to be related to the BIT study and how those can be incorporated both in the short term and over time. So those are those will be the primary focus of our comments, especially when we meet together. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you, Isaac. Um, Lynn Burnett. One comment that I would have, is there any consideration being taken with regards to the diminishing, potentially diminishing um, revenue sources with either the fuel tax, with um, half cent sales tax, things like that, that we are using as part of our local matches and, and local monies with the COVID situation and potentially if there are recurring bouts where we do have to limit the amount of, of people being out obviously it will have an impact on, on what revenue sources are coming in has it has that been looked at yet even preliminarily to see what impacts it, it may have or could have on uh, our 2045 yeah yeah then we've actually had those preliminary discussions with dot and i was going to uh, talk a little bit about, about my staff report later on but really we're going to provide an emphasis on you know there could be a stimulus coming along the way in the short term in terms of project investment. So we were trying to emphasize uh, any shovel ready projects or, or what DOT would look to lean on and, and things that we could get done right away using any direct stimulus related to infrastructure going forward. Uh, but we are preparing for, with, at the DOT level, Kevin Tebow provided a report last week at the MPOAC meeting about uh, diminishing possible, you know, revenue tax. We're well aware of, you know, gas tax, local taxes, all those things are going to decrease and that will likely result in a, um, in a shrinking of, of the work program in the following year. Um, what is going to be done about that is, is yet to be determined and will that likely be a topic, you know, several years going forward. Um, but that will certainly be something that we'll discuss um, with DOT, but also with you all um, in your meetings as well. So we'll be prepared to, to work through all that. Thank you. Yep. Um, Kim Clayback. Um, I'll save our comments for after we've had a chance to review it more thoroughly. Thank you, Kim. <clears throat> Clark Davis. Alex Davis Shaw. Hello. Um, I think the city of Sarasota will save comments until we've had a chance to review it and, and, um, you know, because we get several people working on components till we get a chance to look at our various efforts as well. Great. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Nicole Galehouse. Hello. Um, we, we don't have much else to bring up, but we look forward to the discussion on this and meeting about it in the future. Great. Thank you. Brett Harrington. Document. Um, I'll coordinate with Paula Wiggins on that one. All right, thank you, Brett. George Eisminger. Amy Nelson. Our, our director, Jeff Strom, has submitted some comments already. And um, if he has anything else to comment on, we'll bring it forward. Great, thank you, Amy. Ben Newman. No comment. All right, thank you, Beth. Carla Owens. Brian Pissarro. No comments at this time. Great, thank you, Brian. Mo Ryan. Jonathan Robertson. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, I, I did have a question about trip funding, but it, it's apparent that that can't be included in these forecasts, and that makes sense. But um, in the past, in in uh, District Four, we we were able to use creatively use some trip funds when the new fifth year comes along, and and um, maybe get some of the um, projects uh, in this type of plan funded uh, in that fifth or sixth year 
as trip comes along and we find out what we get. So just a, an FYI, something we were successful in getting some buses with trip funding in that way. So hopefully that's something we can do here. Thanks. Right, great. Well, we can work with DOT and, and, and looking at making that a possibility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mickey Ryan? No comment. All right, thank you. Gary Sawyer? Myra Schwartz? Kathleen Weeding? No comments at this time. Thank you, Kathleen. Paula Wiggins? Um, a few preliminary comments. Um, one, I echo Lynn's concerns as far as the revenues. We're already going through our, with our budget process of having to reduce our operations and looking at our, where we can uh, cut costs in CIP um, for this fiscal year as well as uh, next fiscal year, uh, 2021. Um, to uh, congestion within uh, within our urban service boundary, which include honorary cattle and telling or telling avenue, sorry. Uh, but we'll discuss further when you guys meet with us. Yeah, great. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, we're we're well aware of the of the of the issues that are likely to be on the horizon and ready to work through them with you. Um, I know Nelson's sub for Clark. So Nelson, do you have any comment? Yes, uh, we need to regroup here and then discuss soon internally and provide you comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nelson. Um, I know we got Brian's comment already. Um, Justin, do you want to add anything at this time? Um, nothing specific. I think what we can do is, I know that you guys are doing a town tour with all the jurisdictions. Maybe we can sit down, um, maybe before it, uh, with staff and DOT work program, and we can kind of talk more so about, um, funding solutions and options that are available. Thank you, Justin. And Colleen. Hi there. Um, I, I definitely, we need to circle back internally, I think at the city just to discuss this, but I would share, um, you know, we have a lot of projects in the pipeline on US 41 throughout the city. And so I think this is gonna remain um, a high priority for us. So I just wanted to get that on the record at this time, but we'll really look forward to talking with you all when you come to meet with us. Great, thank you, Colleen. Um, so with that said, I think with the next steps, uh, we'll look at staff meeting dates that we just have preliminarily on our calendars are the 8th, 11th, and 15th. I think those we internally discussed will be about an hour. Um, we'll work with Rachel, we'll work with your staff and get those on the calendar if you have availability of those days. If you don't have any availability with those days, we'll work with your schedule and, and, and try to get something on the schedule so we can talk through these staff meetings and look through these projects as well as potentially the revenue going forward. Um, and then preliminary town tour dates, those are going to be more community related and, and more probably looking at two hours for those meetings. Um, so those are just some preliminary dates there as well, June 1st through the 5th, June 8th through the 12th, um, just those two weeks and looking and getting those on the calendars. So um, with that said, we'll move on to the, I think the FTO yeah. report. Oh. Um, and Colleen, you can add anything if you'd like. Well, I, I just, so um, I know in the past, we've gotten emails from Rachel about um, the available slots for town tour dates and, and yep. working with us to schedule those. Is that something we should expect or do you want us to reach out to you guys? Uh, Rachel, we, we can we can work, staff will probably send something out here and just reiterate this information and then just let us know what you've got available. And if none of those work, we can we can definitely work around our schedules and find something to get on the schedule. Okay. So we'll we'll reach out here initially here probably soon after this meeting. Okay. And then one other question I had, um, cause I know on my calendar, I had initially the barrier island traffic um, committee was scheduled for this morning and due to um, what's going on. Um, I just wanted to, to check and see when maybe you're gonna cover this in your staff report, but if 
you guys are planning to reschedule that and when we can expect to see that? Um, we, I do not know that off the top of my head. I'd have to maybe check with Leah when that would happen, but I'm, but I'm sure whenever we can get back to meeting in public, um, <laughs> that, that probably would be a possibility. If, if, if not, if that continues to linger, I'm sure we'll try to find a way to get that, um, as well as the TISMO back in the books. I know the TISMO meeting's not until September sometime, so we're, you know, we're obviously hopeful that's, that's a possibility and, yeah, maybe we'll look into a way to, to revisit the, the BITS committee as well. Okay, that sounds good. I know traffic isn't as much of a problem right now as it um, was maybe a few months ago. So 